Um, so we're going to be learning a talk of the Nabalacher Rebbe, but it's not going to be in Parshas Vayelach. I do apologize. In case you were getting geared up for Parshas Vayelach, I'm sorry. But it is going to relate to Shabbos Shuvah, which is this Shabbos. We um, are supposed to do Shuvah in the 10 days of repentance. And uh, we, it's also going to relate to the Torah reading of Yom Kippur and the Avoida of Yom Kippur, the Kayan Godel's um, work in the Beis HaMikdash on Yom Kippur. So hopefully it'll give us some food for thought for the uh, approaching holy day. So the Pasuk says in Parshas Achraimos, which talks about what the Kayan Godel is supposed to do on Yom Kippur. Aaron should offer the bull, which is a sin of offering of his, and he should atone for himself and his family. The, the later Pasuk says, it seems like a repetition. Aaron shall offer his bull of sin offering to make expiation for himself and his household. He shall slaughter his bull of sin offering. The commentaries say that the repetition of to atone for himself and his household, the first one is referring to his wife. He has to atone for his own sins and the sins of his wife. And then the second time he says vidui, he makes a confession for the sins of himself and his family and all of the Kohanim. And only after that does he bring the sacrifice of the goat, which is to atone for the sins of all of the Jewish people. The Bachar Shor, one of the commentaries explains that the order of the tshuva and the vidui, the repentance that goes together with the um, confession that he's saying, has to do with what they teach us on the airplane. When they say, in the case of the loss of cabin pressure, and you have to put on your gas, uh, your, your oxygen mask, first put on your own mask, and then help those around yourself. And the idea is, if you want to be able to help those around yourself, you have to have your own oxygen. Otherwise, how are you going to make sure that you have muted you, Dr. J, but feel free to unmute yourself if you need? Um, how else can you possibly help other people to atone for their sins if you're still stuck in your own. So that's why the order of the vidui, of the atonement and the confession was first for himself and his family, then his larger family, which is all of the Kohanim, and only after that was it for everybody else. Okay, so now we're gonna to skip to the beginning of Tractate Yuma. Rabbi, I have a question. Yes, please. So what's uh, the situation if a person uh, becomes from, is a, uh, is a returnee to Judaism, and he's trying to have an influence on other people, but then he can think to himself, I have to be a tzaddik first before I can try to influence other people. And a person should be not, not have to wait for that level to try That's to help true. other people. That's a very good point. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, since we're learning his teachings, we can quote him on this matter as well. He would often say, if you know Aleph, you should teach Aleph. You don't have to wait to know Bayes to be able to teach Bayes. So that's true. You don't have to be perfect to offer your teaching and your inspiration to others. On the other hand, 
the more you will perfect yourself, the more you will make yourself into a mensch, the better you will be able to influence others because your words will not be hollow and, and just like, you know, just words, but they'll see that you're living with your teachings and it's alive for you and, and it's important for you and they'll be able to accept it. So the, the, the both go hand in hand. On the one hand, we have to not wait till we're perfect to influence others. On the other hand, we should remember that we should try to make ourselves as perfect as we can. There's never, we're never gonna be perfect. We're not Moshe and we're not Avraham and so on. But to the extent that we could, we should fix ourselves because that will help in, in everything that we do towards others. Not sure if I've answered your question, but like a good, good politician, you just gotta say something. <laughs> yeah, you answered 100%. Okay, good. So the Gemara in Yuma says, it's actually a Mishnah in the first uh, Mishnah of Yuma. Rabbi Yehuda, I'm Rabbi Yehuda says, Af isha acheres maskinen loy, shema tamus ishtoi. So a kayan gadol is obviously a necessary component of all of the service in the Beis Hamikdash on Yom Kippur. The kayan gadol did everything on the day, every single service to God that took place in the Beis Hamikdash on Yom Kippur was done by the kayan gadol. That means not just the particular services of Yom Kippur, which are the goats and the bull that we just read, and he, and he would go in with incense to the Holy of Holies, but even the daily sacrifice, which was every morning a tam and a lamb in the morning and a lamb in the afternoon, the daily incense that was brought in the morning the afternoon, the lighting of the menorah, everything was done by the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur which, by the way, is very different than what the Kohen Gadol had to do the rest of the year. The rest of the, the year, the Kohen Gadol had to do nothing. I mean, he was supposed to be in the Beis HaMikdash physically or in the Mishkan. He was not supposed to leave, but he didn't have to do anything. He had the option to do everything, any. Any particular avoid, any particular service in the base of Mittish that he wanted to do, he could do. Even though there were other Kohanim and they used to make a lottery every morning to see who would get to slaughter the daily sacrifice, who would get to uh, accept the blood, who would get to sprinkle it, who would get to bring the different parts on the altar, who would get to light the menorah, who would get to bring the incense. All of these things were, were figured out by a lottery. If the Kohanim showed up, everything stopped. If he wanted to sacrifice, he wanted to light, he wanted to do the incense, he took priority. But that was completely optional. If he didn't feel like it, he didn't have to do anything. Whereas on Yom Kippur, he had to do everything. It was a big job, by the way, to be a Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur. Because you had to do all of that after being up the whole night. They would not let him sleep on the night of Yom Kippur because a man who falls asleep might have an emission at night, which might cause him to become impure, and he would not be able to serve as the Kohen Gadol. To make sure that would not happen, they would keep him up all night. So he had to be up all night. He had to immerse in a mikvah five times, because every time he would change his clothes, first we would put them on in the morning, then he would change them from the golden clothes to the white clothes, back to the golden clothes, back to the white, back and forth five times because he had to go into the Holy of Holies four times. So he had to actually immerse in the mikvah uh, all of those times. And of course, this was all done while fasting. Perhaps he was not a young man, so this was not an easy job for him. Nevertheless, this is something he had to do. And the Mishnah says they would always prepare a second Kohen Gadol in waiting. And in the language of the Mishnah, excuse me, it's called the Sgan Kohen Gadol, which would be loosely translated as a vice Kohen Gadol, which means that he would step in if the Kohen Gadol would pass away, which, by the way, did happen some years, especially if they did something problematic in the service. 
they might be punished with death. It even happened once in the Holy of Holies. So, so uh, they always had a second Kongot already. Rabbi Yehuda adds to that. They also had a second wife ready for the Kohen Gadol because his wife might die. The Pasuk says he has to atone for himself and his family. His household is referring to his wife. So he had to have a wife in the wings, a wife in waiting. We're not going to discuss how that affected his Shalom bias and his uh, getting along with his real wife to know that there was a second wife in the waiting. But nevertheless, that's our Behuda's opinion. Omrullah, the sages disagreed, and they said, him came in Lebdavrasayf. If that's the case, there's no end to the matter. If you're worried about death, maybe both will die. So maybe you should have a third one. And therefore they say, we don't worry about it, and we only have a second Kohen Gadol, and not a second wife. We're not worried about death. We are worried about impurity. The reason we have a second Kohen Gadol is because maybe the first will become impure. That's a more likely scenario, but death is unlikely to happen. After all, it only happens once in a person's lifetime. So that's, that's it, only one wife. But the fact is they do agree that there has to be a wife. Everybody agrees that the Kohen Gadol has to be married. If the Kohen Gadol is not married, he cannot perform any of the services of Yom Kippur at all. Not only can he not do the Yom Kippur parts of the service, the unique sacrifices that are brought on Yom Kippur, but he cannot bring any of the sacrifices at all, the daily, the, the menorah, the daily incense, nothing. He has to be a married Kohen Gadol for all of that. And the question is, why is it so important? Are you asking a question, Bruce? You're muted. I don't know if you're talking to me or somebody else. Okay, I guess he's talking to somebody else. Okay, so the question is, why is it so important for the Kohen Gadol to be married for this, the service of this day? I mean, he's, he's doing a very holy service. He's going into the Holy of Holies to represent the people in the holiest time of the year. Why is marriage an essential component of it? Obviously, we understand marriage in general is important, right? We are not like the Catholic religion that believes that the priests have to be celibate. We don't believe there's a contradiction to marriage and holiness. And in fact, it's a mitzvah to be married. It's a mitzvah to have children and so on and so forth. But what exactly is the connection between this mitzvah of being married and being the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur? Okay, maybe I should stop my soliloquy for a moment and invite questions or comments before we continue. Anybody? If you have no questions or comments, I'll just assume that everything is clear as day. I have a question, Rabbi. Um, yes. Can uh, this, the whole purpose of uh, having the wife is to be like the other, like the the people that go to the temple. In other words, he has to have, the wife has to make the chava, the wife has to make, in other words, has to have a household to, because he has to be part of it. Is, isn't that correct? That is the beginning of the answer. That is correct. So he gonna, has, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, we're, we're going to come to that point, but what you're saying is correct. He has to be one of the people. He cannot be a person who separates himself from the people, and, and being married is definitely part of that. Yes. Yes, that's making sure that you... Um, correct. Anna, yes. Anna wants to say something. Anna. Yes. <laughs> I simply believe that a married man actually has much more wisdom as if he is the highest priest he has completely different life experience. He is responsible for someone in addition to be responsible for himself. That's why his leadership skills, his wisdom 
his life experience is definitely above someone who is single. Yes, there is no question about that. It actually reminds me of, of a different law, which is that a judge in the Sanhedrin, a judge in the high court, not only does he have to be married, but he has to have had children because then he experienced the difficulty of bringing up children and he can relate to other people's difficulties. If he never had children, even through no fault of his own, even if he got married and he just never had children, he cannot relate as well to other people who have those trials and tribulations and he cannot be a judge. So that's a similar concept, yes. Very good. Anybody else? Okay, so we're, we're going um, to... Yes. Can, I, can I ask? Yes. What was the situation with Aaron and his two sons? They didn't have children. Did he expect yes. that they will take over after him and be Kohen Gadol? So actually, they not only did not have children, but they never even got married. And they were very eligible bachelors. And there were many Jewish women who were waiting on the shidduch lists for them. And they always consider themselves, I hate to use these words for big tzaddik, and they always consider themselves too good for everybody. <laughs> and um, that was actually one of their sins. Okay. They, they died for entering the Holy of Holies without permission. But together with that, the Talmud has many opinions as to what the, their sin was in addition to that. And one of the opinions is that point itself, the fact that they did not get married and have children, which meant that their holiness and their serving Hashem was one that was removed from the world and not connected to the world. They were unable to bring their connection to Hashem into daily life. They, they kept it like separate, like they had to be separate from the world. So they would not be able to take over. In the long run, they wouldn't. I mean, presumably, if they or would have stayed they alive, me. presumably, if they would have stayed alive and they would have wanted to be the Kohen Gadol at some point in the future, presumably, they would have gotten married because they would have known this halacha. But at that point, they were not eligible. Yes, that's correct. Okay. So, in order to explain this idea, the Rebbe brings the statement of Rabbi Yossi in the Gemara. It's in Shabbos 118b. And the reason that he brings this is because the, the Pasuk, the verse from which we learn that the Kohen Gadol has to be married, doesn't say, ishtoi. He should be for himself and for his wife. I'm going to mute you if you don't mind. Oh, you are muted. Good. Okay. It doesn't say he has to atone for himself and his wife. It says he should atone for himself and his household. Literally his house. And the Talmud understands that it's referring to the wife. But the verse itself doesn't say that. Which it could have, by the way. Because we know that the written Torah often relies on the oral Torah to interpret what it means. But usually that's if it's one word in the written Torah that is expounded in the oral Torah and explained in various different ways. So therefore the Torah writes it, the written Torah writes it in a code and the oral Torah extrapolates on that code to learn many things from it. But here it's really just one word. So what is the Torah not just say ishtoi, the chiper ba'adoi va'ad ishtoi. He should atone for himself and for his wife. And that would have accomplished the same thing as writing besoi. So in order to understand this, the Rebbe quotes the Gemara and Tractate Shabbos 118b. Here we go. Om Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yossi says, note five. Rabbi Yossi says, I never in my life called my wife, my wife. 
and I never called my ox my ox. Rather, I always referred to my wife as my household, and I referred to my ox as my field. Now, obviously, we're not talking about how he spoke to his wife in second person. Presumably, he called her by her first name. We're talking about when he was referring to his wife to other people, he referred to her as his household. So the commentaries explain that Rabbi Yossi looked at what the purpose of everything was. The purpose of having a wife in his mind, the main purpose of having a wife, is to have a family. And because that is the main purpose of having a wife, he saw and he called his wife by that title, because that's what was important to him. Similarly, when we buy an ox, I mean, nowadays we don't buy oxen, but a farmer might nowadays buy a tractor or whatever it is. The purpose of the ox and nowadays of the tractor is to plow the field, to be able to grow the produce and so on. So he saw the potential and the purpose of that ox, which is for the field, and therefore that's what he called it, because that's why he had it, and that was the whole idea of having it. So it seems like a very cute thing. You know, the Gemara has things that are kind of not so clear as to what the lesson for us is. It doesn't seem to be hugely important to know that Rabbi Yossi did this. However, this behavior of Rabbi Yossi comes in the Gemara after a list of many positive behaviors that Rabbi Yossi did. Both before this teaching, there are many positive behaviors that he did. And after this teaching, there's many other positive behaviors that other Amirahim did. So just from the continuity of this page of the Talmud, it seems that what Rabbi Yossi was doing by calling his wife his household and his ox his field wasn't just a cute kind of nickname, but it was something important, something with significance, something praiseworthy, which is why it comes after all of the other ones. Just to give you an idea of what these praiseworthy behaviors were, uh, I put them into the notes. We're not going to dwell on them, but we'll just read them through. And that will show you how in the list of behaviors, this is obviously something important. So 6a, my portion should be among those who eat three meals on Shabbos. It's not always so easy to eat the third meal, especially on a winter's Shabbos, when it's a short Shabbos and you finished your, your second meal not so long earlier, to cram in the third meal is not so easy. Nevertheless, Rabbi Yossi says, my portion should be among those who, who do eat those. Rabbi Yossi says, my portion should be amongst those who praise Hashem every day by saying, Zimra, those are the verses of praise in the beginning of davening. So obviously that's something important. We do have that in our prayers every day. May my portion be amongst those who pray with the reddening of the sun. He wanted to always daven in the morning just as the sun was rising and in the evening just as the sun was setting. And the purpose of that is that, that those are special times that are uh, uh, an auspicious time in heaven. And that's why we have the idea of davening a Nate's minion. It's called a Nate's minion when, uh, when, uh, when people daven so that they reach the Amida, the standing prayer, just as the sun rises because that's a very special time to pray. So Abiyasi said he wanted to be amongst those who always did that. D, Abiyasi says, This uh, seems a little bit, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A bit uh, depressing. But he says he wishes to die from intestinal disease. As the master said, most righteous people die of intestinal disease. Basically, that's a very, it is a, considered a painful death. And he felt that if he would die from that sort of death, it would bring him a kapara, an atonement for his sins. 
My portion should be amongst those who die on the path to perform a mitzvah. So even in death, he wished to be in the middle of doing a mitzvah. Here's an interesting one. May my portion be amongst those who accept Shabbos in Tveria, which is in a valley where day turns to evening earlier, and among those who take Shabbos out in Tveria, which is located on a mountaintop where the sun is visible for long and Shabbos ends later. So in Tveria, because there are mountains around it, it gets dark earlier, and people accept Shabbos earlier, even though technically the sun is still in the sky, it's just hidden by the mountains, they accept it earlier. In Tzipoiri, which is on a mountain top, they can see the sunlight for longer, even though it's technically after Shabbos should be considered over, but they, it's still light for them, so they take it out later. So he wishes to be, in not physically in both places, but like the people in Tveria who accept it early, and like the people in Tzipoiri who take it out late. So he wanted to take mm -hmm. an early Shabbos, and take it out later. Yes. Um, as far as I know, Tsipori was not far from Tveria, and people Correct. used to actually walk there to be longer on the Shabbat. To have oh, that's an interesting Shabbat. idea. What? That's an interesting idea. Yeah. This I didn't know. Rabbi, Rabbi Smith told us. That's very interesting. Okay. I will accept your word for it. Although I wouldn't mind looking it up. Let me see if I can find it quickly. <coughs> Rabbi Smith told you I should but really just accept When we were studying about smells and we were talking about Tveria and Zipporah and he says because people wanted a long Shabbat, they would start in Tveria and finish in Zipporah. They would walk That's over to Zipporah. That is very interesting. So, so he meant that he would literally want to do both. Right, right. I'm just looking in my uh, Talmud here that I have on my computer. See if he brings that uh, explanation. That's correct. Rabbi Kiva Eger brings that in the name of the Rimi Gash. That's correct. That they were so close that you were allowed to walk from one to the other on Shabbos. So he meant literally to, to be in both places on Shabbos. Right. Okay, but not everybody agrees with that. Some say he, he didn't mean it literally. Sometimes, some say he meant it figuratively. That he wanted to be... Sounds like the right road. idea. I'm sorry? Sounds like the right idea. Right. So, the point is that we're up to G. Abiyasi said, my, may my portion be amongst those who seat others in the study hall who cause others to come and study, and not among those who cause others to stand to announce what time it is to leave the study hall. You know, at the end of the uh, learning time, somebody bangs on the table, and that's it. Everybody goes to Dav Mincha or Mayrev or whatever it is. And he didn't want to be the one to stop the learning. Even though somebody has to do it, he wanted to be the one who would get it started, but not the one who finished it. I want to be amongst those who collect that staka, but not who distribute that staka. Distributing staka is very difficult because you have to try to figure out who deserves, who doesn't deserve. You're judging people. Sometimes people get upset. You should have given me more. I remember a lady um, when I was living in Melbourne, Australia, said to me how that staka person in charge of the tzedaka, uh you know, thing, before he would include her family, came to her house to inspect and make sure they were needy. And she felt very belittled that uh, he inspected their home and so on. So it's a, it's a difficult thing to be a distributor of tzedakah. And he, he preferred to be a collector rather than a distributor. Amr um, Abiyasi, the last one. 
May my portion be one amongst uh, one whom others suspect of sin, because that will keep him humble, but there's no basis for suspecting him. But in fact, that he did not sin ever, or you know, not in the ways at least that he was suspected of, so that uh, he should he should be righteous. Okay. Rabbi, Rabbi yes. will you be able to, to uh, email it to us, to, to me at least? Rabbi Smith uh, emailed it out. He told me he emailed it to everybody. Oh, he did? Okay, I didn't see it. I, I came into the house uh, two minutes before the class. So. That, I, I mean, I, he told me he would. So. Okay, thank you. I assume he did. Yes, because David. it's too much to write. Down. Yeah, if you can go back to G. Yes. So uh, uh, he doesn't want to be the ones that are announced that it's time to leave the study hall and go to yes. eat. Yes. So uh, I used to live in Toronto and the rabbi was David, Rabbi David Shachet. Uh -huh. So we used to have uh, extending Yontif into the week by having a Furbrengen. Right. And it would extend the time of Yontif into the week. Yeah. So at the beginning of the Furbrengen, or in the middle of the Furbrengen, he asked me to go around with a paper bag and collect everybody's watches. That's cute. So there, so there wasn't going to be any time of announcing that it's time to leave. And Very go cute. You have to be somebody on the level of Rabbi Shafat to be able to do that, because uh, most people wouldn't appreciate that. But yes, that's an interesting idea. It reminds me of something that I heard Rabbi Herschel Schusterman used to do in Chicago, Allah Shalom, that uh, somebody who used to come to eat by me Shabbos said that, that he was there to eat by him for a meal together with other big supporters of the yeshiva at that time. And Rabbi Schusterman collected their car keys before the meal. He collected their car keys. And he said, we're putting you up to sleep in different houses. Nobody's driving home. So <laughs> you have to be a big rabbi to be able to do that. So thank you, Rabbi. I just found the paper. So. Oh, very good. I'm glad. OK, so here is what the uh, explanation behind this is. The reason that this idea is listed amongst the tremendous uh, accomplishments and good traits of Rabbi, of Rabbi Yossi, which we just listed, is because it shows us that Rabbi Yossi saw the ultimate purpose and the ultimate goal in everything. Like it says, if you skip ahead to number nine, Ezehu chacham haroya esanoilad, who is a wise person, a person who sees what is going to happen. He anticipates what is going to happen. And therefore, to Rabbi Yossi, when he saw his wife, he saw in her the very purpose of their getting married, which is to have a family and to have a future in the Jewish people. Nobody says that that's the only reason we get married. There are other reasons we get married. We have companionship. We have the idea of having a partner and life. Men and women have you know, romantic desires and that's normal and that's okay. And therefore we get married for that reason. We're protected from, uh, from sin and, and looking for other partners and so on. Yes, yeah, Susan, you have a question? Isn't that uh, like from the Kabbalah that uh, somebody who anticipates the future, that's a very rare person. That's not just uh, a, regular, a regular man in the street. That has to be somebody who studies and who knows human nature. And it's not, it's not, that's very special, I think. I mean, I, that's what I'm thinking. That's very special to anticipate the future. It's not a fortune teller. That's not what I'm saying, but it's, that's very special. 
So here's the way the, the Labavitch Rebbe understands that teaching in the Talmud. The point of that teaching is not that he's a fortune teller and he can see the future. Because not every scholar is on the level of, of being a tzaddik who's able to do that. What he's talking about over here is that it's, it, it's, it's more of a logical way of understanding. When a person behaves in a certain way, the result will be X. If a person, you know, you know, is lazy, doesn't get his act together in terms of working and, and getting an education for, for a, a job, he, he's not going to be able to make it financially, for example. So he sees that coming. He sees, for example, the result of, um, you know, a fight. Might start as a small fight, might start with a comment, but it could get out of control and could cause great angst and anguish. So it's more of a logical uh, thing that he has. But what's unique about the wise person, as opposed to somebody else who might also realize that, is that the wise person sees it. That means it's so clear to him as day, even before it happens. Somebody else might be remotely aware of it, but they don't really think about it. You know, let's say a person has, has money. They have an inheritance. And they're, they're living the life. And they know in the back of their mind, you know, this money's going to run out one day. I really need to get an education. <laughs> and I really need to get a job to be able to support myself afterwards. So uh, a person who's not a wise person knows it, but doesn't see it. If they would see it, they would do something about it. But they know it, but they push it to the back of their mind. A wise person sees it, sees it right away, and therefore adjusts his behavior accordingly. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that they, they see what is going to result from what they're doing, and they, they, they visualize it already. That's what it is. So going back to Rabbi Yossi, other scholars did not have this trait of calling their wives their households. Why? Because there's many other positive qualities to being married, and there's many other mitzvahs that a person fulfilled by being married, in addition to having children and making a family, and they also consider those to be important. And therefore, maybe sometimes they refer to their wife as their household, but not always, because there, there are, like I said, there's other positive aspects of being married besides having children. However, Rabbi Yossi saw that the ultimate purpose, the main purpose in getting married is to have children and have a family for the continuity of the Jewish people. And all the other accomplishments of marriage in his perspective, were secondary to that main goal. And therefore, he focused on what the main goal was. And by focusing on the main goal, that helps you along the way as well. Just to give you a simple example, if a person is considering marriage for other reasons, not so much for the family, for the future, there might be things that are of a greater priority to him than if the main thing is to have children. For example, is it the external beauty? If it's just about partnership and romance, so then the external beauty might be a more important factor than the person's true character. But if a person realizes that the main goal in marriage is for a family, then the main thing they're looking for in a partner is a person with good character, kind, humble, patient, and so on, so that they'll be able to impart that to their children. Of course, we're not saying that they have to, they, they, they should be physically repulsive, right? You have to be able to have a romance as well. It's part of being married, but that is of a secondary nature of less importance than the character of the person. So the same thing goes for staying married, for that matter. If a person considers that being married is about companionship and, and you know, just having somebody to partner with and be with, those are important things. 
but a person might say, well, I've had my time with this partner and um, maybe it's time for you know, companionship with somebody else. But if a person thinks about the fact that the main purpose is for the household, and if he has children with this partner, then his attitude is going to be, well, the whole reason for this marriage is to have a family, and, and to get divorced would break up that family and cause great distress for the family. So I'm going to stick with this partner and I'm going to make it work. I'm not saying a person should be in an acrimonious relationship. I'm saying on the contrary, a person should work on the relationship they're in, recognizing that it's important for the sake of the family itself. This is why there is no bracha on the mitzvah of getting married per se. If you've gone to a chuppah, which I'm sure you have, so you hear the bracha on the kiddushin, on the, on the ceremony where the chassan gives the kala a ring. It's a beautiful bracha. But it doesn't say that we are doing the mitzvah of marrying a woman. It says a very poetic blessing that Hashem commanded us about forbidden relationships. He forbade betrothed women. He permitted women who are married to us through chuppah and kiddushin. Blessed are you, Hashem, who sanctifies the Jewish people through chuppah and kiddushin. So it's more of a bracha in which we praise Hashem for the idea of getting married. The same thing is with all the Sheva brachas that we say under the chuppah and then later on during the Sheva brachas. They're all about the creation of man and the creation of woman and chasan and kala and how it was in Gan Eden, how it will be in the future. Beautiful blessings. But we never say, Baruch atah Hashem alakin melechaylam, asher kedushanu mitzvayisav lekadesh eser isha that Hashem sanctified us with his mitzvahs and he commanded us to get married. We never say that. And the commentaries explain that the reason is because this mitzvah is not a mitzvah for itself. It's a mitzvah leading to the next mitzvah, which is the mitzvah of having children. And therefore we don't say a bracha on it because it's not the final mitzvah in the mitzvah train. So... This relates, if we go back to number seven, to something the Gemara says about Rabbi Yossi. Rabbi Yossi says, Rabbi Yossi said, I only had relations ever five times in my life, and I planted five cedar trees amongst the Jewish people. Meaning to say he had five great children, and the Gemara lists who they are exactly. Now, the Talmud actually revises this uh, statement a little bit because it's actually considered a mitzvah for a couple to have relations uh, more often, depending on the occupation of the husband, whether it's once a week, twice a week, more, uh, more often, less often, and whatever. So I basically kept that mitzvah as well. And the Gemara explains what he meant. But the point is that in this mitzvah as well of intimacy, to him, the main objective was to have children as we see from this statement. So he always saw in, in everything the objective of it. And the same applies to when he called his ox his field. He saw what the purpose of his, of his possessions were and treated them accordingly. They're not an end in themselves. There's no purpose in having a lot of stuff unless it's leading you to a goal. You have oxen, okay so that you can have a field, so that you can grow what you need to grow, so that you can use it to support your family. And when we keep our eyes on what the goal is, then we'll make sure that everything we do is in line with that goal and not get distracted by secondary things. So this is coming back to answer the question that we started with. Why does a Kayan Gadol have to be married? The answer is because being married means not just being married, but it means establishing a home amongst the Jewish people, having a family, being grounded, teaching everything that you have and everything you know to the next generation, being responsible, as was mentioned earlier, for your spouse, but not just for your spouse, but also for your children. A Kohen Gadol who does not have who does not fulfill those mitzvahs. So even though he may be flying high 
in his service of God, but he's flying up to heaven and he's not bringing heaven down to earth. He's separating himself from the people. And here, the rest of the people, hopefully, are married and do have families. And if they see their Koyangaro as somebody who is not married, then to them, they might get the impression that, you know, really to be holy, the right thing to do is to be separated from this world, disconnect ourselves, I'm not saying that they will get divorced, but they, they'll think that there is some kind of contradiction between holiness and, and being part and parcel of this world, being active in this world. And that's where the Kongadal has to be married, so that he can be an example of somebody who's able to go into the Holy of Holies and represent the people in the holiest place and the holiest time of the year and come back after Yom Kippur and do the dishes. It's not a contradiction. You can be a holy man and you can do the dishes and you can change a baby's diaper. I don't know if they did that in those days, but <laughs> whatever the uh, corresponding thing to that is, uh, it's not a contradiction. And this is a very important lesson that the Jewish people had to take from the Koyim Godel. Okay, I do have another point to make, number 10. But let's uh, pause if there's any questions. Um, I, I, wanted, I wanted to say it's probably a sign of stability to be married. It's, you, are, you are more set, set in, your, in your life. You are more settled in your brain. You know, you probably, yes. probably part of why, why it's required to be married. Yes, that's true. Person who's married is, is usually a more settled individual. That's true. Person that hopefully knows how to compromise, get along with the person who's different than themselves. And uh, also, if he has children, has, has leadership qualities and teaching qualities. Yes, all of that is true. Yes. Can you please explain to that? Um a little bit different consequences of our modern time. With this whole ideas of emancipation of women, how do the um, rabbis who are, I'm, I am absolutely sure dealing with it in many marriage situations or mar marital problems, how do they address it? Because it's definitely an obvious problem. It's a problem of um, a wife, I, I understand perfectly all of the ideas of Rabbi Yossi, which is absolutely makes total sense to me, but the time is so different now. And in many cases, it is a, a, a partnership is a little different. Is it any explanations that you give to a young couple who are saying, oh, you know, my role in, in this marriage is different? So, Rabbi Yossi spoke as a male in the Talmud, which is a male-authored book. So he was giving his perspective as a male, obviously. But we have to understand the teachings of the Talmud and apply them to be understood for women as well. And a woman also should see in her partner the continuity and the family and what they're establishing together as first and foremost, above and beyond the personal relationship and the intimacy and the, and the togetherness that, that all brings. It's not a contradiction. What he's saying about his wife is something that his wife presumably would have said about him, but his wife wasn't speaking in the Talmud, so he's speaking. But that's a general thing about the Talmud that even though it's spoken, by men, for the most part, not always, but for the most part, but the lessons are to be understood to apply to both. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, it's true that in general, the roles of men and women have changed very much in, in the world at large. And, uh, you know, they've changed in, in most um, Jewish circles as well, even in the most Haredi circles, it's expected much more that the husband share the household share chores, share in the child rearing, 
and the wife has much more of a say than she did in previous decades and centuries in terms of the finances, in terms of the way the household runs and so on. So that's the nature that the world has taken. And there's nothing in the Torah that, that says anything against that. The Talmud presents a system for the society, the way it was organized at that time, when women did not have property, did not do business, were not expected to take roles outside of the house. So the traditional role given to them was taking care of matters of the home, and the husband took care of matters outside of the home. But in the more modern world where those roles have changed, it's not a contradiction to the Torah perspective to say, okay, now that the wife is involved in so many things out of the house, and is a partner in so many other of those things, it's only right that the husband should also be a partner in many of the aspects within the home and share those things equally. So when I, you know, I do teach uh, young men who are getting married, my wife teaches uh, young women, it's called chasan classes or kala classes. So when I teach them, I say, you know, nowadays, you're not a tzaddik if you do the dishes. You know, maybe in 50 years ago, you were a tzaddik for doing it. Now you're not a tzaddik. Now that's just normal. You know, Don't pat yourself on the back. That's just the way it is nowadays. Everything has to be considered equal. And, and you know, you just figure out how every couple obviously figures it out for themselves, who does what, but it's not considered extra credit anymore. It's considered just the normal way marriages work. That's in principle, the rule is actually staying the same it's it's the the result of this kind of relationship should be a healthy and you know, god given you know child child children in in the family to continue it uh, as a as a family unit but you explained that some additional details can be actually discussed and it's not something extraordinary that's what i understood from yes you. Nation. Yes, it's not okay. a contradiction to the Torah values to, to consider people as equals. Okay. I mean, not people, but, but partners, spouses. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, so let's go on to the last point of the talk. And this point is about the final Mishnah of Yuma. The first Mishnah is the one that we learned before about, uh, you know, Kohen Gadol having to have a wife. And the final Mishnah is this one. Um, so I'm going to skip to number 11 because number 10 is not so uh, important at this point and we don't have so much time. Um, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva says, Ashrechem Yisrael, lucky are you the Jewish people. In front of whom do you purify yourselves and who purifies you? It's your father in heaven. I will sprinkle you with pure water and you will be purified. Excuse me, it says, Mikveh Yisrael Hashem. Hashem is like a mikveh for the Jewish people. Ma mikveh metares atmeim, just like a mikveh makes those that are impure pure. Afakadosh Baruch Hu metares Yisrael, so too Hashem purifies the Jewish people. So, what exactly does Rabbi Akiva mean when he says, Ma mikvah metaris atmeim, afa karash brochu metaris israel, just like a mikvah purifies those that are impure, so too Hashem purifies the Jewish people. What exactly is the connection between how Hashem purifies us and how a mikvah purifies us? What, what do we learn from this, from this idea? So here is the idea. You know, there are different levels of impurity. Nowadays, we don't really follow these laws of impurity. We don't have a Beis Amigdash, so it's not really so relevant. But nevertheless, the lessons can be learned. So there are some impurities that are not removed by a mikvah. For example, the impurity of a dead body. You need to have a special sacrifice with a red cow and so on. That's not going to happen until Mashiach comes. And then there are impurities that could be removed by a mikvah, but they also take more time, perhaps seven days, and so on. And then there are impurities that can be removed by a mikvah alone. Now, a person might think that 
if they're not going to become 100% pure, then there's no point in going to the mikvah because they're, they're going to purify themselves from a lesser impurity, but they'll still be left with a greater impurity. So what's the point of entering the mikvah? doesn't help at all. So there's a Mishnah in Tractate Brachas that says, no, Zov Sherek Shara Keri, this is not in the notes, I'm just telling it to you. Venida Shapolta Shech Lazera. If there's a, per, a male who is a Zov, so that's a seven day impurity, but he also had a seminal emission, which is a one day impurity. And the same thing for a, a Nida, which is a woman who's going to be impure for seven days, but at the same time, she also has a one day impurity. They can go to the Mikra and be purified from their one day impurity, even though they will still have their seven-day impurity. So this is what we mean, what Rabbi Akiva means when he says that Hashem purifies the Jewish people in the same way. A person needs to do tshuva. It's the time of tshuva, time of the year for tshuva. Hopefully we do tshuva from everything that we need to correct. But let's say a person is not up to it for whatever reason, or he thinks he's not up to it. He thinks he doesn't have time. He doesn't have the energy. He knows he has 10 things to fix, but he but he's not going to fix them all because he says he doesn't have the strength to do it. It's too hard. He's too fixed in his ways. But he wants to fix one thing. There's one thing he wants to fix. So he should know Hashem purifies him for that one thing. Even if he's not fixing everything, it's like a mikveh. You can fix one thing. Hashem can forgive you for that thing, even though there are still other things to fix. And hopefully, if you do, a person does a successful tshuva on that, he'll understand and he'll see how it's possible to correct that. And that will help him along his path to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing until he co completely corrects his ways. So this is a teaching on the first Mishnah and Tractate Yuma and a teaching on the last Mishnah and Tractate Yuma. And hopefully it helps us uh, get ready for the holy day of Yom Kippur that is coming up. Any questions? Thank you very much, Rabbi. My pleasure. Very uh, innovative, very interesting discussion. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. David, you ready for the one-minute uh, summary? Yeah, that's great. That's what I was going to ask for. <laughs> okay, here goes. So the Kayan Adel has to be married on Yom Kippur because being married means that he has responsibility and he brings holiness into this world instead of staying separate from the world. And the Kayan Adel has to be an example for the people that he's leading that they should be able to do the same thing as well. And another lesson we learned at the end is that even if a person is only able or willing to correct one behavior or more, but has many other behaviors that still have to be fixed, they should not hesitate to correct that. Hashem will accept that tshuva. And hopefully from there, they'll be able to graduate uh, and, and be able to do other levels of tshuva as well. Thank you. My Thank pleasure. Thank you very much, Rabbi. If I don't see you again, have an easy fast. Thank you, you too, an easy fast, and a Gemar Chasim a good year for everybody. I think we're taking a break for a few weeks, so we'll meet again after. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.